parables and we've been looking at these parables to turn the parables into prayer since this is a prayer fellowship so we're we always seek to keep prayer at the forefront of what we do here in this particular meeting because prayer is absolutely essential and we as a church need to continue praying we must not stop praying individually or corporately and and actually i, I believe sometime in march we need to have a, a prayer night where we just or, or a day of prayer of fasting or maybe a night of prayer or something we need to have more emphasis on prayer and get more get back to that as well but we need to pray and luke chapter 18 is a parable of jesus christ i entitled this parable and this is not this is not original to me the title of the parable that i give to this a good man lost a bad man saved and i put good man in kind of parentheses like that or you know in, in quotes and a bad man in other words a man we would consider good but yet he's lost and a man we might consider bad and yet he's saved and this is the teaching of jesus unlike anything the world has ever seen let's read the story in luke chapter 18 and beginning at verse 9 and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others two men went up into the temple to pray the one a pharisee and the other a publican the pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself god i thank thee that i am not as other men are extortioners unjust adulterers or even as this publican i fast twice in the week i give tithes of all that i possess and that's the end of his prayer <laughs> no amen just that's it. it's over that's his prayer okay and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven but smote upon his breast saying god be merciful to me a sinner and thus his prayer is over very brief i tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other and read the last statement in verse 14 together with me for everyone that exalted himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted Oh, Father God, please speak to our hearts. Lord, draw us into your presence tonight. Help us to know that you are here. You are here to speak to every heart, oh, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your amazing, miraculous teachings that you give to us parables. You give to us discourses. You show us miracles. Lord Jesus, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this special time. Speak to our hearts now and be glorified, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So here we have two characters on the opposite end of the social spectrum of their day. You have the, the Pharisee, the one who is highly respected by all people. When we walked down the street, people knew him by name and they respected him and he was appreciated as a religious person trying to bring God and the word of God into the society there. He was the spiritual person. And then you have the publican. He was the he was the one who would walk down the street and they would like, they would want to spit at his feet. He they would snicker at him. He was the sellout. You have the spiritual and you have the sellout. Jesus gives us the prayers of them. And the amazing thing is, the one you would think who would definitely be saved is lost. And the one you would think, no doubt, that guy has no interest in God. He's lost. He's saved. So Jesus speaks this parable. Notice what he says here. What's the purpose of this parable? I like it when Jesus just tells us straight up, what is this purpose? Here it is. He said, he spake this parable, verse 9, unto certain. And guess who those certain were? Those are the Pharisees who were listening to him who were snickering at him, who were mocking already. The Bible says they were even deriding some of his teachings, even through this. He spoke this parable to them, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. 
Now, what strikes you about that? You know what strikes me about that is this, this question. Why is it that someone who views himself as righteous, why is someone who trusts in himself, He's trusting him in himself, and he views himself as righteous. Why does he despise others? Why does that lead to hate? Why does... Because <laughs> yeah. of the pride of the, of the heart. So here's the religion of so many people. The religion of trusting in yourself. And I, I would just say this. I think that Jesus is teaching this parable, and he's giving the most popular religion in the world and the most unpopular. The most popular religion in the world is really the religion of this Pharisee. It's thinking that you're righteous in yourself, and you're trusting in your own righteousness to save you. That is really the basis of every world religion in the world, other than Bible-believing Christianity, those who are trusting in Jesus alone. So this is the most popular religion in the world versus the most unpopular. But yet it's the most dangerous religion in the world versus the most blessed religion. Because really the most dangerous religion to have is a religion where you trust in yourself. Because there's no hope in, in you. There's no hope in me saving myself. What is impossible for me to enter into heaven through my own works? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the, the, the sad fact, beloved, and this is why we are here. This is one of the great reasons why we are here in the heart of Manhattan, New York City, is the most popular religion in the world is also the most dangerous. In other words, the most popular thinking that people have is I'm a pretty good person, and I'll just add a little bit of religion to my life, and, and I'll just do a few rituals and a few works, and, and I'll be good enough to enter into heaven. That's the popular way of man's thinking, and that's dangerous because it only leads to hell. So here's the most arrogant religion in the world versus the most humbling. It is most arrogant to trust your own works, to think that your righteousness will enter it, will get you into heaven. But the most humbling is to trust in Jesus alone and say, I am such a sinner. I needed a savior to, to be brutalized and beaten and bloodied to pay for my sins. But yet rise again so I can live through him. So here are these two religions. And as I mentioned earlier, it really is striking that those who trust themselves and view themselves as righteous despise others. And this kind of condescending attitude, this kind of proud and arrogant attitude does lead to a spirit of antagonism toward other people. We see hate in religion. All kinds of religion, even if it's sometimes so-called Christianity. Of course, we see it in Islam and all the terrorism of it. That word despise others, that's a very interesting word that Jesus uses here. It says, he spake this parable to them which trusted in themselves and, they, and that they were righteous and despised others. That word despise if you look in Luke chapter 23 look up a few verses to verse 11 this is the very word that is used toward Jesus Christ by the by Herod and his soldiers toward Jesus and no doubt the Pharisees despised him as well but here we see that Jesus himself was despised in Luke 23 11 it says and Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. So here, Herod and his men of war, it says, set him at naught. That's the same word in the original language, despise. That is, they had a snobbish and haughty, arrogant attitude of total disrespect toward that person. Now, let me ask you, shouldn't our faith lead us to fear God, to love God and love man? <laughs> Doesn't that where, where true faith leads? But here, the, the faith of this Pharisee led him, it says, to trust himself and despise others. And we have to realize we have the same kind of wicked, sinful heart as this Pharisee. And if, if but by the grace of God, we will be just like him. So let's look at a few things tonight about this. We see 
a good man lost. And just a few things about him. Number one, if you're going to take notes, there's a few blanks if, on, on your prayer bulletin if you want to fill them in. We see that he prays. That's letter A. He prays to who? Who does he pray to? Now, when you pray, you think, I'm going to pray and talk to God. So this is a prayer meeting. Who are you going to pray to tonight? Who am I going to pray to? That's a challenging, that's a really challenging question. Who are you really going to talk to tonight when we pray? Look what it says. The Pharisee stood, verse number 11, and prayed thus with himself. He was talking to himself. Now, use God's name, but he talked more about himself in the 33 words that he spoke in this prayer. He used I five times. That's a high percentage of me in the, in the midst of that prayer. He prays to himself. So his prayers didn't reach God. It says he prayed with himself. His prayers reached his own heart and made himself feel good. We're not here to pray and make ourselves feel good. Tonight. Make sure your prayers are truly to God. Second thing, look what his prayer, what is his prayer really all about? When he says, I thank thee, I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Can you imagine praying tonight? And boy, I'm glad I'm not like that person. So what is he doing? He is, in his prayer, he compares himself to others. So he prays to himself, and he compares himself to others. And as he compares himself to others, what does he see? Who does he see? Now, when we pray, who should we see? We should see the Lord. Our prayer should lead us to talk to God and help us to see God for who he is. His prayers lead him to see his own moral superiority of those around him. And he compares himself to them. And he's so glad that he's not like them. So he sees his own moral superiority in the very presence of God. I believe if we're in the presence of God, we should see his moral superiority. He is holy, and we want to be like him, and we're humbled in his presence. Prayer should lead us to see the Lord. His prayer leads him to see himself and others and how good he is in comparison to them. Wow. That is not the kind of prayer. I'm glad I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not a... I'm not a thief, a robber, a money harpooner. I'm not unjust. And by the way, he, he says here, I'm not, I thank you that I'm not unjust. You see that word in verse number 11? Well, when Jesus finishes the prayer, he says, this man, which would be the other man, the publican, went down to his house justified. So he didn't think he was unjust, but in Jesus' sight, he wasn't just because he wasn't made righteous through faith. And through the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. So he compares himself. And then we see that he exalts himself. That's letter C. He exalts himself. B is he compares himself to others. He prays to himself. He exalts himself. Look at everything I do. I mean, how many people do you know, Lord, who fast twice a week? How many people do you know, Lord, as good as me, who give tithes of everything that I possess? So he professes not only his moral superiority, but his religious superiority. Oh, I'm such a good religious person. Lord, you are so blessed to have me in your house tonight praying to you. That's his attitude. What delusion. He thought good works made a good heart. But like Jesus says, on the out, well, outside, he was like a whited sepulcher, like a, a grave, a, a whited grave. I mean, it looked nice on the outside, but inside were dead man's bones full of iniquity. So self-righteousness leads to contempt of others. Pride and such arrogant hatred are the Siamese twins of Religious self-trust. When people are trusting in themselves that they are righteous, they will really look down their nose at others. Why can't you be like me? 
That's pride. See, grace causes us, when we understand grace, we look at others maybe who are, are lost and in sin, and we don't, we don't look down upon them with contempt. We look down upon them with what? Compassion. And we know that I could be right there, but by the grace of God. And we also, grace always causes us to remember where we came from. We don't forget where we came from. And I, I, I was reminded of Paul's words, even more words that he spoke or wrote, more toward the end of his ministry, where he said, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am what? Chief. And literally, I am in first, I'm a first place sinner. I am a gold medal sinner. And he uses the present tense at the end of his ministry, at the end of his life. So, but Paul never forgot where he came from. So we see this good man, humanly speaking, considered good by the standards of his world, lost. Do you have a faith that has brought you salvation by grace through Jesus Christ alone? We must know that. You know, people who think they're going to be saved by their works, I mean, how good do you have to be to be saved by good works? You know? What, do you have to be just a little bit better than Hitler? Yeah. That, that's about people's standards. You know, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't do what Adolf Hitler did, so I'm good. I'm going to go to heaven. You know, now listen, we're all sinners. You know, I think one of the best illustrations I ever heard about that is, is God's standard is holiness. How holy? Perfect holiness. God's standard is good. How good? How good do you have to be to get into heaven? Completely good. It's like, well, that's it for us. We're all toast, right? So it's kind of like God's standard, humanly, is it's, it would be like, okay, we're going to all stand at the bottom of the Empire State Building and jump to the top. Okay? <laughs> now, you might be able to jump. To, I know you could jump taller than me, higher than me, and I could jump higher than probably a few of you, too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the fact is, all of us are going to what? Come short. And God's standard, he is so holy and we are so sinful, we all have come short of his glory. And the only way we can get into heaven is through Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And so here we see this bad man saved. So let's look at this now in the publican praying. The publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So here we see not the religion of self-trust, but I call this the faith of Jesus' trust. Here, this publican is trusting in the Lord, not his own works. He's a publican. That means he was a tax collector. He knew he was a sinner, but he's praying to God. Now, I heard, maybe you've heard of the missionary John Payton, great missionary. He went to the New Hebrides Islands in the South Pacific in the, in the 1800s. And he was determined to tell the, the tribal people there about Jesus Christ. They were cannibals. They would... They would hunt you down. People did hunt Peyton down, and he spent nights in a tree, you know, as they were hunting him down to try to kill him and then eat him. His life was in constant danger. Now, in the New Hebrides, nobody trusted anybody else. There was no trust amongst the people. So they had no word in their language for trust. <laughs> they had no word for faith. They had no word like that in their language. So Peyton began to translate the New Testament, and when he came to the word faith, he, he there was no word to translate it. So he was struggling, how do I translate this word trust, faith, or to believe? And so one day, he was sitting there in his office doing his Bible translation. One of his helpers came in, and Peyton was sitting back in his chair, completely resting in his chair, and he had his feet up, and he said to his, his worker, he said to him, what am I doing now? And the word he gave, he said, that's the word for trust. Because he was leaning his whole weight upon it. And that's how, that was the word they had in their language. 
they knew what it was to lean back in a chair and completely recline and not and just kind of take 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 five with a, a, a glass of lemonade or something, you know. So to rest and recline all your weight upon something. That was the word he used for trust. And that's a, that's a good definition for trust. The faith that saves is the faith that reclines all of its soul weight upon Jesus Christ. Amen. So three things about this so-called bad man who was saved, who, who evidences and illustrates for us a faith in Jesus Christ. Number one, we see his heart attitude. What is his heart attitude in verse 13? First of all, he stands afar off. He felt himself unworthy to approach God. It says here, he would not lift up his eyes unto heaven. He had a deep consciousness of sin that pierced his soul. This is his heart attitude. That's letter A, his heart attitude. He stood afar off. His head was bowed, unworthy, a consciousness of sin. And what did he do? What was he doing? It says he was, he was smiting his chest, his breast. He smote upon his breast. Now, why his breast? What's in there? The heart. And he was there indicating that the evil that came out of his life arose out of the heart, which is exactly what the Bible says. That the heart is desperately wicked. None can know it. And so, with a sorrow for sin and with great shame, he smote upon the very... A, a fountain of poison in his in his life, and he knew where his mischief lay in his own sinful heart. He was not blaming others. He was not comparing himself to others. He was just broken before God. And that's the way for us to come to the Lord tonight. Just broken before God. So we see his hard attitude, but we see secondly his humble request, where he says. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, that little phrase, be merciful, is a very interesting word that the New Testament uses there in the original language. This could be translated, be propitiated toward me. Be appeased in your wrath against my sin. Hebrews 2.17 uses this word and translates it reconciliation. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So in other words, he says, be merciful to me. Be reconciled to me. That I could be restored into fellowship, into a relationship with you. So this is a verb. Be merciful to me. The noun form of this word is translated propitiation in Romans chapter 3, verse 5. This is a big word, reconciliation, propitiation. But Romans 3, 5 says, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So that's Jesus. So Jesus himself is the propitiation. So what he's really saying is, Lord, be propitiated to me, a sinner. I need Jesus. <laughs> that's what he's really saying. See, some, some believe at this moment that the sacrifice was burning on the altar and that sacrifice where the blood ha had been shed. And so he's saying, may the blood of that sacrifice cover my sins and appease your anger and wrath toward me. The idea of propitiation, the way I kind of make it simple, is the idea of that God will be satisfied with sinners and that his, his wrath would be removed and he would look toward me pro. <laughs> like the word pro is toward for good. That he would look toward me with acceptance because of the blood of that sacrifice. Propitiation at its root, I believe too in the idea of it, requires blood sacrifice. And that's a huge difference between the Pharisee's prayer and the publican's prayer. The Pharisee's prayer was all about him comparing himself to others, how he was morally and religiously superior. His, at the heart of his prayer, is it's about sacrifice and the, the need for blood to cleanse me of my sins. Now this word, and I would like to, you to go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5. And this is what, very interesting, is that this word, be merciful to me, as I've said, it's been translated reconciliation, propitiation, but in Hebrews 9, verse 5, it's translated mercy seat, the noun form. Now, again, 
Luke, 9, Luke 18, it's a verb, but the noun form of that word is translated in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5, where he says, <clears throat> over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. And he says, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So the mercy seat, you know what the mercy seat is? Go back, go back to Exodus chapter 25 for just a moment. Exodus chapter 25, where we read a, a few things about the mercy seat. The mercy seat, it says here in this passage of scripture in verse 17, Exodus 25 verse 17, it was made of pure gold. It was two and a half cubits long by one and a half cubits wide. So it wasn't very big, but it was pure gold. And then you see that of this mercy seat, in verse 18, Exodus 25, 18, he says, you shall make two cherubims of gold of beaten work. So on each end of the mercy seat were two cherubims, which were angelic type of beings in, in, made of gold. And then he says, put one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. And they were somewhat, they were like part of the mercy seat were these cherubims. And then in verse 20, it says, the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high. So the cherubims are, have their wings on high stretched out and over the mercy seat, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And then these two angels, then it says, look at the details of this, it's really quite fascinating. It says their faces were looking to each other. So the, the angels' faces were toward each other, but what were they looking at? The it says they, were, they, they looked toward each other, toward the mercy seat. Shall the faces of the cherubims be. That was the most holy of holy place in the tabernacle built by Moses and also later on in the temple built by Solomon. And the most holy of holy place was this mercy seat. This is where the, the, the glory cloud of God's presence abode, where God was present in a thick smoke. This was the heart of God's presence. And so again, this publican is praying, Lord, be my mercy seat. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. You know, the amazing thing about this mercy seat is it sat flush over the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was made of wood covered with gold and at different times in Israel's history there were different things in it at the most I, I could find three things uh, but always there was the the law of God yes. the commandments the, the the tables of stone that God gave to Moses at other times there was the manna the, a pot of manna and there was Aaron's rod but and, and I think this is this is really uh, really sweet is that when those things were inside the Ark of the Covenant, it represented Israel's sins and failures and disobedience and rebellion against God. Their rebellion against the law of God, their rebellion against being grateful for his provisions with the manna, they always complained about that, and their rebellion against the leaders that God had provided, the, the, the rod that budded represented their rebellion and refusal to receive the leaders that God had for them. But yet, what covered all their sins? The mercy seat sat flush completely on it. And then once a year, the high priest would go into the holy of holy place and put the blood on the mercy seat. So this publican prayed a pretty deep prayer, just a few words. <laughs> it wasn't about him. It was about his need for the blood of the lamb to cleanse him from his sins. The third thing and the last thing here, is his honest confession. He simply says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And I do like in the original language, it uses the definite article. He says, the sinner. God, be merciful to me, nothing but a sinner. Oh, thank God we have redemption through his blood. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Revelation 7, verse 14, it says that some washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Thank God that while we're sinners, 
The blood of Christ forgives us of our sins when we believe in him, when we cry out for his mercy. Make sure that you're saved. Make sure that you have that true saving faith that is trusting and resting entirely upon Jesus Christ who died for you, who rose again. And that's why we're here tonight to pray. And we know that as we come to him tonight with humble hearts, with broken hearts, feeling unworthy, but yet feeling his call to come boldly to the throne of grace, that we will come and that we will come and find that grace and mercy before his throne and in his presence tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for your great love. Thank you, Jesus Christ, that we are made justified by your grace, by faith in you. While we're not worthy and none of our works could satisfy your holy anger towards sin, we thank you that Jesus Christ, your work satisfied the holy justice of our Heavenly Father and that we are accepted in the Beloved. And thank you, Lord, that we do have forgiveness, dear God. We have cleansing by the blood of the Lamb. That while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus, you died for us. And though we are chief of sinners, we thank you, Lord. We come to you, our Lamb, who cleanses us from all sin. So we praise you tonight. We rejoice in you this evening, O oh God, that you are so good to us, that you are so merciful. Help us to be witnesses for you as well in our city. There's so many people who have the religion of this Pharisee. We pray, dear God, that those who are trusting themselves, whether they say they are atheist, Baptist, or Catholic, or whatever they may say they are, if they're not saved through Christ, somehow they're trying to find salvation through their own goodness, through their own rituals, through their own religion or works. We pray, God, for the salvation of souls in our great city, for men and women to truly repent and trust you, Jesus Christ, and rest completely and entirely upon your wonderful work for us on the cross and through the empty tomb as you live now. So, Lord, continue to bless us through this night. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. So, uh, Brother Adrian will come tonight. God bless you.